I'm going to be talking about contrasting the secular view of happiness to the Jewish view of happiness. And I'll start just with some basic etymology. Anybody know what the root of the word happy is? If you think about it, I'll give you a hint. Hapless, haphazard, happenstance, which means what, right? It means almost chance. It means if you're lucky enough, most people in the United States, if you ask them, what do you think will make you happy? The average answer by most people say a little more money. If you're lucky enough to win the lottery, if you're lucky enough to have a lot of money, you're guaranteed happiness. The Hebrew word simcha is the whole other concept. And that's what I'm going to be spending these um, 45 minutes, uh, 40 minutes talking about, is what's the difference between happiness and simcha? I was privileged to learn with Rabbi Palm, who's a great rabbi um, who passed away uh, not too long ago. And he used to tell us when I was in yeshiva, he said, the difference between happiness and simcha is how you feel the morning after. And it was so true. In the years I worked in a hospital, the morning after New Year's Day, you come to work and almost all of your colleagues were hung over. And when I'd come to work the day after Rosh Hashanah, they'd all say, oh, hi, David. Uh, it's the day after your New Year's. You all hung over? And I'd have to take a step back. And it was a whole different kind of an experience. And that's the essence of the difference between happiness and simcha. But I'm going to lead off with two enigmas. And this is enigmas that um, led me to really think about the difference between happiness and simcha. Number one is I'm sitting at a High Lifeline retreat, a retreat for families of children with cancer. And it's um, a weekend retreat. People come from all walks of life. And at this point, it's Shabbos afternoon. People are very comfortable with one another. You have a whole range of the Jewish community there. And a chassid is sitting down. And he just lets out the following statement. He says, you know, he said, this last Rosh Hashanah, my son was diagnosed with leukemia. And 10 days later, it was Yom Kippur, I was sitting in shul, and a wave of happiness washed over me like I never felt in my entire life. I didn't know what he meant. And I'm sort of like taken aback, but then I look around and all the other parents sitting around with tears in their eyes are nodding their head like they know exactly what he means. So that's question number one. How could you call 10 days after what must be one of the most traumatic events in your life, how could you call that one of the happiest days of your life? Makes no sense. So I want to address that. And the other just comes from a book that many of you know, Man's Search for Meaning, by Viktor Frankl, a psychiatrist who was in the concentration camp and developed a whole form of therapy based on his experiences and was a brilliant, brilliant thinker. And in his book about his experiences in the camp, Dr. Frankl has a section where he talks about a woman who's about 20 years old, and it's the last minute of her life literally the last minute of her life. He was the doctor in one of the wards for people who were, I think, um, sick with typhus or any of the other horrible illnesses that people were prone to there. And she calls him over and she says, Dr. Frankel, she says, you know, I'm looking through the slats in the ceiling at God's beautiful world. I see the sky, I see the clouds. And she says, you know something, before I came here, I was a frivolous teenager. I didn't know what was important in life. And now that I look out at the beautiful world out there, I'm happier than I've ever been. And she closes her eyes and she dies. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? And how does it contrast to the secular view of happiness? 
Let me spend a little bit of time telling you before I go to the Jewish uh, thoughts on this. Let me spend a little bit of time just sharing with you, first of all, the money happiness connection. A lot of research on the money happiness connection. And it all comes to the following. Money doesn't hurt, okay? Um, there's uh, certainly common sense would say, and that's what the research shows, that um, obviously um, money doesn't in and of itself make us unhappy. But here's what the research shows. Once our basic needs are met, the amount of money you have makes no difference. The research review that's most respected on this topic concludes with the following paragraph. It says, you could be a man in the back of your limousine making millions of dollars a year in your investment banking job and driving to work in your penthouse office. And there could be a man in the bus lane next to you who's wearing his blue collar going to his construction job with his lunch pail on his lap. And if you try to predict the happiness of those two men, it would be chance. You have no way of knowing what their happiness is because it's irrelevant when it comes to happiness, except there are exceptions. One exception is the exception of affluenza, which I'll talk about later today when I talk about child rearing, which is a some higher risk of um, depression and lack of ease in, in um, adolescents who grow up with money. There, if you have more money, you're at so, about triple the risk for depression, and I'll talk about the three active ingredients in that uh, later today. But the bottom line is that there's another component that gets in the way, and that's the more money you make, the more you want to make. Okay, King Solomon said, Ohev kesev lo yisba kesev. He or she who loves money, it'll never be enough. Because it's not about the money, it's about what the money means to you. Let me tell you my favorite story about relative deprivation. Actually, I have a number of stories, but I have to control myself. I'll keep it to this one story. Here's the story. There's a man named Robert Frank, well-off guy, very respected economist in the United States. And he shares the following incident from early in his life. He graduates university, and he's idealistic. So he volunteers for the Peace Corps program in the United States, which idealistic young men and women volunteer two years of their life for service. He is assigned to a very impoverished section in Africa. Um, I just blanked on what country, I, I, but it's a very impoverished section somewhere on this continent. They meet him at the airport, and they pick him up in a van. They take him on a 12, 13-hour drive to the center of the country, and they drop him off, and they say, we'll pick you up in two years. You're going to be a teacher here for the next two years. And he discovers he's going to be um, living in a one-room hut with no running water and no electricity. He thinks to himself, he, he comes from a very affluent background. He thinks, how could I possibly survive this? He says, I, I can't do it. But he says, an amazing thing happened. He realizes that everybody around him is living in similar conditions. He's no better or worse than anybody else. Everybody else has a one room hut, no running water and no electricity. So he's, he's um, he says, it didn't even take him more than two, three days to get used to it. Amazing. But here's where the story gets interesting. He gets his first paycheck. It's going to be $40 a month. Okay, $40 a month. What's that, about 320 no, wait, that's, I don't, I won't, I won't even pretend to understand this, okay? But he's going to be living on $40 a month. In the community I come from, in um, a suburb of New York, if you gave your child such an allowance, you'd be charged with child abuse, okay? <laughs> so um, that's not a lot of money. And he's, he's you know, this uh, 23, 24-year-old guy, he thinks, I can't live on $40 a month. But listen to what happens. He discovers that nobody, this is Nepal, it just came back to me, actually, so I was wrong about, about, about where I thought it was. 
he discovers that nobody in that region of Nepal is making any more than $30 a month. And he goes on in, in um, a book he wrote on this experience to say that he never felt wealthier in his life than he did living on $40 a month in a one-room hut with no running water and no electricity. It's an amazing, amazing um, lesson about the nature of the money-happiness connection. In the United States, correcting for inflation as the standard of living doubled and, the, and then tripled, depression rates went up even more than that. So there's no clear connection whatsoever. So we know the answer is not money. What is the answer? The answer in the research is often referred to as the three Fs, not the F of funds. Anybody want to guess what the three Fs are? People usually do a pretty good job of two of the three. Almost everybody gets friends, that's right, family. The third F is often hard. Who wants to guess the third F? When I speak to groups of girls, they usually say, very good. When I speak to groups of girls, they usually say food. And um, I won't tell you what boys often answer, but it's faith. It's, um, it's the third F is faith. And I'll just spend a little bit talking about it, but I'm going to give you, in a way, the three Fs are in this room. The three Fs are in this room. It's family, friends, and faith. In order to illustrate some of this, because I do want to spend time going through the um, Jewish concepts and then make some recommendations about what the research tells us about bringing more happiness into your life. So here's what, the, what, what, what one example of, of, it, of this is, is the town of Rosetto, Pennsylvania. Rosetto, Pennsylvania was a town in the United States that puzzled medical researchers um, because they found that almost everybody in Rosetto lived for a very long time. There was almost no sudden cardiac death in Rosetto, Pennsylvania. And they couldn't figure out why. They compare it to neighboring towns, medical epidemiologists. They think maybe it's, there's more exercise, a healthier lifestyle. No, if anything, they eat a little more chant in Rosetto. Rosetto is filled with people who aren't as healthy. They don't exercise as much. So they realize it's not lifestyle. And then they crack the code. The medical researchers figured out why people are living longer in Rosetto. Turns out that Rosetto was settled by a group of immigrants from southern Italy in the late 1800s, and it had a tremendous sense of community, a tremendous sense of faith. The homes there were built with front porches, and the old people in town would sit on their rocking chairs on the front porches and keep their eye out for the teenagers in town, and one of the teenagers skipped school. The whole town, all the senior citizens in the town would grab the kid by his or her ear to the head of school's office. You couldn't even have an impure thought in Rosetta without people knowing about it. There was a tremendously high rate of volunteering in Rosetta. And it was a faith community marked by an abiding faith. In fact, if we talk about the F of faith, Every day a week, the research in other areas shows that a person goes to Minyan, their happiness levels go up correspondingly. Again, there's something magical about feeling like we belong. There's something magical about what this very special day represents. So what happened to Rosetto? What happened to Rosetto was starting in the 1980s, the new generation started to reject the old Italian folkways. They even changed the architecture of the homes to have two-car garages. They got rid of the front porches. People said, oh, it's old-fashioned to volunteer. They changed the lifestyle tremendously. Faith became a matter, organized faith anyway, became a matter of the past. Today, Rosetto has the worst death rate in that section of Pennsylvania. Amazing. 
amazing. The power of family, the power of friends, the power of faith. What does Judaism tell us about simcha as opposed to happiness? What Judaism tells us is actually very, very simple. It's probably best explained by the words of the Chazonish, great rabbi of the last century. The Chazonish said the following, for he who knows the light of truth, there is no sadness in the world. I'll say that again. For he who knows the light of truth, there is no sadness in the world. This was a man who went through a lot of suffering in his life. But when you're connected to meaning, when your head is connected to a place of feeling like your life has purpose, that's simcha, or as some say, shamoach. It's where your head is at that determines a level of happiness that's true and abiding happiness. It's all about that kind of connection. And the research shows the same thing. We all know that very often when people feel they're adrift, sometimes people who are children of uh, immigrants, who feel they don't belong in either society, have a higher rate of ri risk. Sometimes it's people who lose their faith, or people in general who feel like they don't fit the bumper sticker of their family. Anything that makes you feel like you don't belong is gonna, your, your risk of depression is going to go up. What's the answer then to the two enigmas I shared with you? I just gave you the answer, right? That chassid sitting on that Shabbos afternoon of the Chai Lifeline retreat, why was 10 days after his son's diagnosis one of the happiest moments in his life? Because it's not happiness as we think about it. It's a sense of profound connection. Last night, when I was sitting and experiencing the unbelievable feeling of connection, of a community coming together in a shared purpose, I felt a wave of happiness. I felt very, a very spiritual moments, but I also felt simcha welling up in me. Because that's what it's about. And that's why the chassid felt that. Because he was surrounded by the support of his family and his friends and his faith. That woman in the last minute of her life, in some way she was feeling a connection and a meaning that she had never felt before. It's interesting. I'll just spend a little bit of time on this, talking about the geometry, the Jewish geometry of happiness. This is something I could go on about for a long time. But first I'll talk about the straight line of happiness. Straight line of happiness is, is happiness as connection. So we're told, Ar zaru tzadik uli lev simcha. The people who are straight of heart experience simcha. That's the straight line of connection as opposed to being off that line. Anything that takes us away from that line is going to make us feel like we, we, we don't belong. There's something in psychology called flow. Let me explain to you about it. It's a psychologist with a rather odd name, Dr. Csikszentmihalyi. If you looked at the spelling, it's one of the most difficult spellings of a last name I've ever seen. But he did a brilliant, brilliant set of studies that he's very well known for. Imagine if you were texted, back then it was paging, but imagine if you were texted randomly at 20 random points during your workday. And you were asked two questions. What are you doing and how are you feeling? And he looked at what is the happiest time of day for the average person. And the assumption is, is the happiest time of day is when you get back from work and you're kicking back and relaxing. Maybe you're watching television. Maybe you're reading a book. Maybe you're relaxing with a drink. And that would be the happiest time of day. Turns out it isn't. The happiest time of day for most people was when they were immersed in something that gave their life meaning and something that demanded work of them. It was actually often in the workplace. If you're lucky enough to have a job that you enjoy or that connects 
to your strength, your signature strengths, to the essence of who you are, then you're more likely to have happiness. Because ultimately, happiness comes from that internal connection. So maybe a runner experiencing the runner high if they love running. And maybe somebody who loves learning Torah, sitting and totally immersed in learning. And other people, it may be people who love secular learning. Other people, it might be people who love doing acts of chesed, acts of loving kindness. But it was always when somebody was tied to the essence of who they are and it brought out their internal spark. Listen to this brilliant statement from Rabbeinu Tzadok. Rabbeinu Tzadok lived in um, about 150 years ago or so. And I just want to share with you what he said about this key to happiness. Rabbeinu Tzadok said, Kishem Shetzarich Adam Lahamin Bashem Yisparach Just like a person has to believe in God, Kach Tzarich Acher Kach Lahamin Ba'atzmo So too must he or she Believe in themselves. Ratzalomar. Sheesh la Hashem Yisparach Esekimo. God has dealings with you. God cares about you. Vesheinenu poel botel. Shebein laila haya uvein laila avad. And you're not some insignificant being who's here one day and going the next. You matter. You matter. And it's that mattering that's the key. It's that mattering that's often the key to the happiness. And then, another brilliant insight by him. One of the first prayers taught to a young child in our community is a prayer called Moda'ani. You wake up in the morning, you teach little children at a very early age to say, Moda'ani l'fanecha, thank you God, okay, for returning me to life in the morning, for returning to me my soul. And it ends, you say, Rabba Emunasecha. You want to hear what Rabbeinu Tzadok says, Rabba Emunasecha? Rabba Emunasecha means your faith is abundant. But here's the twist he puts on it. What does it mean, Rabba Emunasecha? Shehu mamin banu. It means that God believes in us. If we raise our children to find their inner essence, their inner spark, as I said over Shabbos to some of you, their nigun miyuchad, every child, according to um, Rav Nachman, has an inner tune that we have to nurture and bring out in them. When somebody's lucky enough to live their life tied to that inner tune, that's when happiness comes. Because that's simcha, that's shamoach. Okay, and that's when you're able to have the flow that the research talks about, and that makes all the difference. Geometry of happiness, one last thought, and then I'll move on to the, uh, to the conclusion. Circles, circles. Turns out that there's much writings about circles as a source of happiness. We're told by our rabbis that the beauty of circles is everybody is equal. Everybody is equidistant in a circle often dancing around a source of meaning. The Talmud tells us that in the future, we're going to dance around God. On Simchas Torah, we dance around the Sefer Torah. At a wedding, there's the circling process also around the center of attention and the center of meaning. And that's the beauty of circles. Spontaneously last night, during the magnificent concert, what happened? Spontaneous. Did anybody stage it? Nobody staged it. Rabbi, was that on the program? I didn't see it on the program. I looked on the program. This is an extremely well-organized event. I'm in awe. I'm in awe. Okay, in Brooklyn, for something that was supposed to start at 10, um, right now they'd be thinking about leaving their homes to begin to maybe look for parking. Okay? And even then, you know. Um, but you know what? A spontaneous circle. And circles we're told very often is the source of happiness. Actually, forgiveness, when you forgive somebody, it's tied, according to the Radak, uh, commentator on, on, um, on the Nach, he says it's tied also to a circle is tied to forgiveness, which is tied to happiness. Because when you're angry at somebody, you're on the outside of the circle. You forgive somebody, you rejoin the circle. You rejoin the circle. 
So let me read to you something um, that I, I'm not claiming is about happiness, but it's about the power of a circle. And I'm not so sure I should share this with you because it's in a way almost hard to understand, but there's something very powerful about this imagery and about the power of the belonging of the family, the friends, and the faith that a circle represents. And this is in a whole other context. It goes like this. This comes from Rabbi Pinchas Katz, who t tells the following story that he heard from his teacher. This is in Germany, in a shul in Germany. As the Nazis closed in on the shul in one of the large German cities, the men in the congregation broke from their typical stately composed style and spontaneously clenched hands and danced gracefully, slowly, in a circle. No one planned it. No one seemed to know what had motivated it other than some deeply embedded sense that this was the way to give honor to God in that final moment before capture, torture, and deportation. This is the essence of the Jewish dance and the Jewish circle. Amazing. Amazing what, how, I guess primal almost, the need to connect and the, the, the finding that that's tied to Simcha. What does some of the research tell us about the sources of happiness? How do you build it into your life? And as I come to the last 15 minutes of this talk, I'll just share with you two sets of recommendations. One is about the power of goals. The power of goals. Turns out that if we took some time now, and I told you, spend the next 20 minutes Imagine the best possible future for yourselves 10 years from now. The best possible outcome for yourself in terms of your personal goals, your career goals, most importantly your family goals. Picture yourself 10 years from now with those goals coming true. And write about it for 20 minutes. Don't worry about the grammar. Don't worry about the spelling. Just write unchecked. And I had you do that today tomorrow and the day after. The research shows that two things happen when you do that. Number one, your happiness levels will go up for a couple of months because you're getting in touch with the straight line of who you are. The second thing that'll happen is it'll make it more likely that you'll realize those goals. You need to examine things. There's a ethicist in the United States, the head of the Center for Ethics in California, who has the following imagery. He says, here's how you have to live your life. Imagine that after 120 years, you're observing your own funeral. And a eulogy is being given about you. And he says, think about the three main points you want the eulogizer to make about your life. And then he says, live life backwards. Live life backwards. Again, a day like today is a day to reflect back, a day to take a step back and think about what is our element? What is it that matters most to us? What is our source of meaning? Because everybody here has their own individual sources of meaning. And getting in touch with it is often the key to a happy life and the key to simcha as opposed to happiness. So that's Recommendation number one is to figure out a way somehow to take a step back. And as couples, the research by Dr. John Mordechai Gottman, one of the leading marital therapy researchers uh, in the world, who's extremely well respected, he's the one who in, um, in his research, it was written about in the, in the book Blink, um, he's the one who has couples get together in his laboratory, University of Washington. He has them fight. He says, fight, no bad a fight, any kind of fight. And in seven minutes, he could tell with 94% accuracy if they'll be divorced in five years. And he then fixes it. He doesn't give you the card of a divorce lawyer. He then works on fixing it. 
It's another talk about what the main predictors are, but it's, a lot of it has to do with the ability to heal, the ability to talk, the ability to hear one another. And John Mordechai Gottman is actually um, finding in his research that one of the key predictors of success in marriage is reconnecting to the dream of yourselves as individuals as a couple. He finds when couples, after the initial passion of the early years of their marriage um, wears off, he finds that when couples are able to continue to check in with each other and they don't turn away from each other, he shows how some couples, you know, the wife is talking about something important to her and the husband is um, having his breakfast and reading the newspaper and she's saying something important to him and he's going, uh-huh, 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 no matter what she says. And vice versa, it could happen in both directions, especially in the age of the internet where we're distracted by our devices. And what he finds is when couples are so pressed for time and attention that they can't even continue to share in each other's hopes and aspirations and goals, it spells some trouble for the marriage. And he systematically has them steal time with each other, find time at least once a week to get away and to talk about their dreams and aspirations, reconnect to the dreams that you talked about when you were courting each other. And he finds that's one of the big sources of happiness and sustaining a marriage. It's an extremely important component of all of this. And the final point I want to make is about the power of belief in ourselves as a source of simcha as opposed to happiness. I'm going to share with you a story that I promised the person it happened to that I would share it. Okay? I asked him permission to share this story, and he said, not only do you have permission to share it, when you get a chance, share it. And it's a wonderful story, and it goes like this. I was giving a lecture about the works of the Piazesna Rebbe. The Piazesna Rebbe was a inspiring and brilliant thinker who was one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto as it was being liquidated and exterminated by the Nazis. And a lot of his writings came to light when um, German construction workers were rebuilding the ghetto and they knocked down a wall and out come all these manuscripts of Rabbi Shapiro, the Piazesna Rebbe, and he says, I have a brother, if you find this, it means I'm dead. I have a brother in Palestine. If you get him these manuscripts, you'll be handsomely rewarded. And that's how we have many of his writings. Only one of his books was published in his lifetime. And they're brilliant insights on how to live in the tough times of life. I was sharing with some of the teachers on um, Thursday that as his students were being led off to deportation and death often in the concentration camps, and an inordinate number of them survived the camps. And people didn't know why, but it turns out, and I spoke to one of these survivors, that what he did with each of them, this was the day he was killed by the Nazis, as they were being taken away to the camps, he held on to them, looked in their eyes, and he said, do chesed, do chesed, and that gave them the meaning. But after I gave a talk about some of the magnificent insights of the Piazesna Rebbe, a prominent doctor in the community I was speaking in comes up to me and he's crying. I say, what? I don't think I said anything that, that would shake somebody that much. He says, you don't understand. He says, the only reason I'm here is because of the Piazesna Rebbe. He said he grew up with the following story. His father was a 13-year-old boy, cold and lonely and alone, living in the yeshiva of the Piazesna Rebbe in the Warsaw Ghetto during those horrible years. And they did everything in the study hall, in the Beit Medrash. He would, they would eat there, sleep there, learn there. And one chilly night in Warsaw, this 13 year old homesick boy fell asleep on a bench near the window. The window was closed, but the chill was coming through, a real chill of a Warsaw winter. And three o'clock in the morning, he wakes up and sort of surprised to see 
that it's the Rebbe picking up the bench he was in, bringing it into the center of the study hall, and tucking him in. Fine, nice, but not so outstanding. I mean, okay, was it a 30-second thing? A nice sign of uh, the Rebbe taking care of all of his students, except the day I just told you about, the day that he told his students to chesed, this now 15-year-old boy is on the selection line in the concentration camp. He's a smart guy. He sees that if you're sent to the left, you're not going to make it. He sees it's the weaker people being sent to their left, the older people. And he realizes he's a puny, malnourished yeshiva boy. And he realizes his life is over before it really began. And as they're about to select him, he's certain to go to the left, to go to certain death. A SS guard comes out and makes an announcement. He says, carpenters, I need carpenters. Anybody who can volunteer to be a carpenter, I want to talk to them. And he thinks to himself, I'm a klutz. I'm a yeshiva boy. I can't even hammer a nail into wood. They'll discover it and they'll kill me right away. And he's again resigned to his fate, inevitable fate. And he tells his children as they're growing up, he says, involuntarily, you know what flashes through his mind? The image of his being tucked in two years earlier by the Rebbe. And he says to himself, somewhat implausibly, he says, I'm somebody. I'm somebody. I'm worth something. Somebody as busy as the Rebbe, somebody as, as knowledgeable as the Rebbe wouldn't have taken the time to tuck me in if he didn't think I'm worth something. And involuntarily, he raises his hand. And he's chosen to be a carpenter. And his fellow Jewish inmates teach him the tricks of the trade. And he becomes a carpenter. And he tells his children, and he told me when I asked him for the story directly, he said that countless times during his years in the camps, when he was about to give up, it was that image of being tucked in that kept him going. It's interesting is that, what does this have to do with Simcha? What does it have to do with Simcha? Our rabbis tell us, Ma'at min ha'or docha harbe min Little sparks of light push away a lot of darkness. Think of that little spark of light about 70 years ago. 30 seconds of a rabbi tucking a kid in. And it's a bonfire today. So you know what happened because of that 30 seconds? Because of him caring enough to take this little boy, this young 13-year-old, out of the chill, there is now a bonfire because he survived and he had a wonderful family. And there are doctors and professors and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren doing unbelievable things. I know a lot of the family. All because of that simple act of belief in a boy. Something as basic as that. And when I think about then the core ingredients of happiness, of the family, the friends, and the faith. What pulls it together for me is also our faith in ourselves, our faith in our children, in our spouses, in our parents, our ability to connect to what's important, to find the goals that matter, to be grateful for what matters, and to find not necessarily the material as the source of, family, of, of happiness, but to find that the source of simcha as opposed to happiness, again, is right here. The family, the friends, and the faith. Thank you. Thank you.